to be here today. Amen. Amen. I'm glad to be here today, and, and I'm glad that you're here today. So at least we have that going for us, right? If you have a Bible this morning, you can find the uh, Gospel of Luke. And uh, turn in there to the sixth chapter. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. I'm going to read this section to you, and then we'll take off into matters that we have to speak about. Um, starting with verse number 46. This is what it says there in the New International Version of the Bible. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on rock. When the flood came and the torrent struck that house, uh, it could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment that the torrent struck his house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. This morning we're going to be talking about how we view Christ, how we view God, and um, we'll see if, if our view is sufficient concerning God, concerning Christ, to actually do us any good. There are some things that we subject ourselves to thinking that they will do us good and they prove otherwise. Um, I, uh, I was looking through some, some things that, believe it or not, we've actually thought were very sensible and very wise to do, things that we thought would be very helpful in times past, um, and I, I probably don't need to say it, but it didn't, it didn't uh, prove out to be that way, uh, to wit. Believe it or not, in the uh, late 1890s, 1898 to be exact, Bayer Laboratories developed a cough syrup that was laced with heroin. Um, they discontinued it, Bayer, uh, the production of that cough syrup in 1910, but only after the addictive properties of it had caused a lot of damage and, and uh, was a lot worse than anything they originally thought. Um, believe it or not, the U.S. did not outlaw the production of such things, similar things like laudanum and whatnot, um, were not actually uh, uh, outlawed, totally stopped from production until 1924. That's a thing that at one time we thought was very smart as far as the inventive, uh, inventiveness of it and the uh, supposed helpfulness of it. In the uh, early 1900s, people believe that radioactivity was good for you. They had uh, all kinds of different radioactive items that were available uh, for purchase, uh, including uh, radium pendants for rheumatism. So if you were suffering from rheumatism, you could look in a catalog and, and uh, order a, a radium pendant uh, to help you with your rheumatism. Uh, they had uranium blankets if uh, you were an arthritis sufferer and you had needed some relief, you could buy a, uh, you could buy uranium blankets, and I guess if you slept under them well, you would uh, you would find that your your uh, arthritis was it was, uh, was uh, contained and managed. Um, they had anti-aging radioactive cosmetics. How about that? You know, you know, you generally cosmetics are in some respect, marketed because they make you look better, uh, and usually the way that that's advertised, it means you look younger. Um, it almost goes without saying that you don't even need the radioactivity in the cosmetic to make you look younger. But they thought that if they put radioactive materials into cosmetics, they would do that, they would make you look younger. Now, of course, we know if you're out in the sun too long enjoying all that radioactivity, you end up with leather-like skin that's all wrinkled. 
Um, they had a bunch of other things as well, uh, including radioactive water. Now today we have various kinds of water. Sometimes the water that we have today is sold in, under similar circumstances. You know, they add a few things to it, some food color, and they tell you it's healthier water. Well, you know, they had that idea back in the day too, only this time it was radioactivity that was the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ingredient that supposedly made them uh, very healthy. Uh, there was actually a story in 1932, believe it or not, I mean, this is how late these things get. In 1932, about a, about a um, this wealthy businessman who drank three bottles of radioactive water every day. And so they did, a, they did a, a story on him in the Wall Street Journal, and the headline read, Radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. <laughs> All these things, you know, made because they thought their idea was these are things that could do you some good. These are something uh, that uh, uh, would end up helping you. Uh, along that line, believe it or not, tobacco was used. Uh, from, the, from the first discovery of it by, by Europeans in the 1500s, of course they didn't really discover it, they discovered Native Americans using it. Uh, but when they did, they thought that it was, they thought it was the panacea uh, to cure everything. Um, they called it a holy herb at one time. And God's remedy, uh, can you imagine that, tobacco? Uh, they used it for all kinds of things, headaches and, and uh, concentration and various other kinds of things like that. Probably that all was associated with the, with the side effects of addiction, but you know, they, didn't, uh, they didn't see it that way. Believe it or not, in the 16 and 1700s, a big thing for medical treatment was tobacco enemas. Sign me up! <laughs> tobacco enemas. Where'd they come up with such an idea? Uh, and uh, actually, until fairly recently, believe it or not, in the, in the uh, subcontinent of India, there was actually tobacco toothpaste. They had a thought that tobacco was good for your teeth. And so, you know, I guess like fluoride, it ends up in your toothpaste. Um, huh. there is a, there's a lot of things that we subject ourselves to thinking that they'll do us some good, and they only prove otherwise down the line. Some things we think are going to be a blessing end up anything but. And then on the flip side, right? On the flip side, there are some things we don't subject ourselves to, thinking that it won't do us any harm to do without them. There's a lot of things, of course, that we, we ignore. I mean, right now, there's some folks that are just don't want anything to do with the vaccines for COVID. Uh, some have one reason or another, but uh, it's supposed to be something that can do you some good, but some people uh, think otherwise and don't think it'll do them any harm if, if, uh, if they do without it. Um, sometimes when we have those kinds of notions about some things that it's not gonna do us any harm if we do without it, uh, doing without it actually proves quite detrimental I let your imaginations fill in the blanks on on that matter. I mean, I'm sure you can come up with a whole lot more illustrations than than I can. But I say all that to say this: Is there any benefit to believing in a Christ that doesn't have to be taken seriously? <coughs> I mean, we're willing to do a lot of things that actually subject us to quite a burden and they end up doing nothing for us. And there are some things that are really necessary to us or would be very helpful to us that we don't think they're worth bothering with. And, and I just wonder, with the conceptions that some folks have of Christ and their practical response to him, as if, uh, as if that somehow or another in their own mind, their thought must be that it really won't do them any harm if they don't take Christ any more seriously than they do. I can remember when I first became a Christian, uh, my, uh, my best friend's mom, my best friend through my adolescence, uh, his mother, in finding about my, out about my conversion, was asking me some questions about it. And, uh, 
anyhow, in, in the discussion that, that I had with her that followed, we got to the place where, where my commitment and dedication to Christ was, was uh, uh, being plainly communicated. And, and she said that, that I was taking Christ too seriously. I think that some folks have a viewpoint of Christ that way, is that, you know, a little bit of Christ can do you some good, but you don't want to overdo it. Or uh, that Christ is something that, that uh, could be helpful or necessary to you, especially if you're uh, in an agitated st uh, state or in some trouble, but, you, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to wreck your whole world over it. Um, some folks, uh, when they think about Christ, just don't think that, that when, it, when push comes down to shove, that he's all that relevant or important to their day-to-day -day life. I mean, even if people don't necessarily express these things like my friend's mother did, the, the practical reality of their, of their actions, the practical reality of the way that they live, is that they really don't think there's any harm in not taking Christ very seriously. That he is not something that really needs to interfere with her life all that much, or that he is not something that really is important when, when things get dicey. Is there any benefit at all to believing in a Christ that really doesn't have to be taken seriously? I mean, I think about it this way, is if Christ is the sort of being, the sort of person who doesn't have to be taken seriously, why should I bother with him at all? I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the world that are powerful, but I don't think about them all that much. And then they're not really relevant to my life. I don't think about I don't think about the Chinese communist all that much. I don't think about the dictator of North Korea. I don't think about I really don't think about whatever Ayatollah is running uh, Iran at this pre present time. It's not that these people in their own spheres are not significant, but what does it have to do with me? You see, for a lot of people, Christ is that way. He's a significant figure. He's a significant figure in history, but what's the relevance to me? What difference does it make to me? They, they, they look at Christ, and for them, from their perspective, they, they say, what's the point, really? He really doesn't make a difference. I'll do whatever I need to do to get done the things I want done, to live the way that I want to live, to see the things I want to see, to experience the things I want to experience. But Christ, <coughs> somehow or another, he's relegated to a place where he does he has about as much significance to me as, you know, as a as a unicorn dancing around the sun. Is there any benefit to having in your belief system any kind of a recognition of Christ that's along those kinds of lines? I'm reminded of a uh, of many times in the Old Testament, but in particular, uh, a reference in Isaiah chapter 46 that I think is is uh, really clear, really brings things to a point, where just the, the thought of idols in that day. Now, we, we don't seem to have too much of a problem with that, especially in the West. We have been a, a, a Christian uh, culture for the most part, European culture that is, uh, for a long time. And, and uh, you know, Christian uh, Christianity has has basically infiltrated all of our mythologies and all of our folklore and all of our customs. And, and uh, you know, it's just it's like we're a tea bag, if you will, our culture in the West. And we've been steeped in Christ so much so that you know it's just part of of things here. Um, but nonetheless, so at one point in time. The Europeans, uh, the Westerners, were very much idolaters. And uh, so what, what Isaiah was saying uh, about idols, I think, is at least relevant in that, that particular sense. And I think that for us today, even though we not, might not have idols of wood or stone or precious metals, um, we do have idols nonetheless, things that we look to uh, for benefit or blessing. Uh, maybe, maybe you're a Warren Buffett follower, right? Uh, now here's an incredible investor, and, 
and uh, Berkshire Hathaway, of course, has this long history of just incredible gains and success. Uh, maybe you look up to someone like that, and you are following along, you know, in the ways that he's doing things, and maybe you're invested in him. Maybe you get his newsletters, and maybe you're trying to do the same things that he has done. Other people have other, other folks that they look look to, uh, other things they look to. Uh, some folks uh, have celebrities that are like idols to them, or even just the idea of celebrity, for goodness sake. Um, some folks worship success. They worship money. They think that money might not be able to buy me love, but it sure can buy me a lot of other things. I said that we don't have idols of precious metals or metals anymore, but you know that's not so true if if you're a person hoarding up gold, thinking that somehow in doing so you're going to be able to bless your life. I mean, uh, everything in its place, everything in its measure, of course, but, but uh, some folks are fixated on things, thinking that they are going to bless them and going to help them. We have idols in our day, just not quite the same type of idols they had back in those days. But let me read to you just a little bit out of this passage that I mentioned in the book of, uh, uh, the book of Isaiah that I think speaks to this in, in quite a, a, a neat way. This is uh, out of chapter 46, as I said, uh, right in the middle of verse number 7. It says this about idols. Uh, they set it up, speaking of an idol, in its place, and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Not like it has arms or legs. It doesn't have any source of animation. There's no real life in it. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer them. Idols don't have ears. They don't have the ability to listen to you and to respond to what you're actually saying. Uh, they cannot save you from your troubles. And I think that's true for all the kind of modern idols I mentioned, kind of that fit the bill in our day and age. Um, we may think those things can, can help us, they, but they don't save you from your trouble. The richest person in the world still has trouble. The most famous person in the world still has trouble. The guy who's the biggest babe magnet in the world still has trouble. Maybe we can go the other way around, right? The, 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 uh, uh, the gal who has the most attention in all the world still has trouble. Uh, the most successful businessmen, most successful corporate leaders in the world, they still have troubles. Uh, none of the things that we are willing to look to for help can, can, ha uh, can help us so much so that we don't have troubles, that we don't face troubles. It seems to me that there's a lot of things that we are willing to take seriously in our lives. I mean, I think about, I think about even when it comes to health. We talked about earlier some of the crazy things they did back in the day, thinking they would be healthy. But that happens today as well. I mean, I can remember talking to my doctor, and um, he, not the doctor I have now, it was an earlier doctor, but uh, asked me about about uh, about what I was doing for my health, and I mentioned that I was taking vitamins, and and uh, his kind of smart aleck response to that was. Well, all you're doing is making your, your pee vitamin enriched. Um, the, the, just the notion was, of course, uh, and many will tell you this, uh, a lot of times the things that we take to try to help us just pass through us. They're not in the right form to be absorbed. They're not in the right form to do any good within the body from the way the chemistry in your body actually works. And so uh, we put money down for them, buy them, put them in our body, they end up passing through our bodies and having done very little, if any, good at all. That's not true for everything, of course, but it is true for a lot of things. We're, we're willing to take so many things seriously. And the things that often that we take seriously really can't do us the good that matters. I mean, even if, even if every vitamin that we shoved down our throat was actually very effective. Would it stop us from dying? 
even if we had all the money in the world, would it, would it somehow or another keep us from difficulty or troubles or heartbreak or loss? If we were the most famous person in the world, would that fame somehow or another make the, the wounds of loss any less real or any less painful? On and on it goes. So many things that we take seriously, and yet they really, they really can't do anything about the things that are so <coughs> capable of harming us in such a deeper way. On the other hand, there's Christ. Now, what can Christ do for you? Well, I think we know most of the stories, but let's repeat them just so that we're clear. The Bible clearly teaches that the sacrifice that he made on the cross, the blood that was shed there, is the only thing that can truly cleanse the human soul of sin. That might not seem like a, a big deal to, to a lot of folks, but I tell you what, if, if you have any idea at all that there's a God to answer to, that means a lot. It's a scary, it's a scary prospect to die and then face judgment. I, you know, I, I, I think that more than anything else, that's why we fear death to the degree that we do. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just a thirst and a hunger for continuing life, it's a dread about what might happen afterwards that really is the kicker. Having blood that washes me clean from sin seems like that's a pretty big deal. The Bible says, talking about Jesus, that he can answer our prayers. I, I read that little passage out of the book of Isaiah. One of the things that he was saying, of course, about idols is, it doesn't matter how sincerely you cry out to something that has no existence. It doesn't matter how sincerely you wish that somehow or another it could respond. The fact is that it can and it won't. But Jesus will respond. He's made promises to that degree. And many people who have taken, taken him seriously have found that those promises are good. Those promises are true. I personally, I, I can't number all the times prayer has been answered for me. Very specific prayer. And at times, very impossible prayer. Jesus said he could do it, and then I found that he can deliver. So Jesus forgives us. Jesus answers prayer. Jesus says that, that when he comes into our life, that he can change us. That's very, that's a very appealing thing to me that I must take very seriously. I, uh, I'm very cognizant of just how poorly I was living life before Christ came into my life. How miserable I was. And I was not just miserable in myself, I was actually miserable in relation to other people as well. Now, I'm very few people's cup of tea, even after all these years of walking with Christ. But I tell you what, knowing where I came from, all I can say is, wow, the presence of Christ in my life has delivered on a promise of transformation, a promise of difference. I'm not the same person I was when I was 20 years old. And I, I trust that I won't be the same person when I'm 65 that I am when I'm 62. That's a pretty cool thing to take, uh, to take in, and it's certainly something that's worth taking Christ seriously. So he can forgive my sin. He can answer my prayer. He can transform my experience and my being as a person. 
And finally, now this is not the only, the only four things, but these are the four that I'm going to name. When this life is over, Jesus can give me life that goes beyond. Instead of being frightened about the prospect of dying and then facing judgment before God, with Christ Jesus, I have the promise of life that starts now and lasts forever. And I won't be subject to a judgment that can undo it. In other words, in Christ Jesus, when I think about death, I don't have to be like, oh, have I done enough? Does God know about this or that? You ever wonder about those kinds of things? I hope God doesn't know about this. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I hope God isn't going to do something about this. He will. Unless. Unless you put your life into the hands of Christ and open up your heart and let Jesus in. Because it's only when you take Christ seriously that those things that are promised in him can actually have their impact and effect in us. Christ can do so much for a person. And yet I tell you, when you look at, for instance, just in America, when you look at the just the, the fabric of our population and, and you would ask people, do they believe in Jesus? You're going to have the vast majority of Americans say, Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. I don't know what percentage it might be. I mean, it used to be very high. But I would guess you would probably get something in the uh, 70 to 75 range, in, even in our current day. But for 70 to 75 percent of the people to respond that they believe in Jesus, I wonder how many of that same group of people take him seriously. And there I think my answer would probably flip and say at least 70 to 75 percent don't take him seriously at all. What's the point if you're in that, you know, that vast majority of a vast majority, what's the point of following a Jesus who you don't take seriously? Why would you not take Jesus seriously? And really, to tell you the truth, the only solution that, that comes to my mind that I can understand is that people don't take things seriously that they don't think actually will have any negative impact or any power over their lives. The reason that people don't take Jesus seriously is they don't think that he's real. They don't think that he has power. They don't think that he can deliver. They think that at best he was a, some ancient teacher that has long since you know, left from the scene but they don't take him seriously because they really don't see him in a serious way. Can looking at Jesus that way do you any possible good? Absolutely not. Now the text that I read you this morning out of the Gospel of Luke kind of touches on this, on this thought, does it not? Jesus is saying, why, why do you put into words the sense that perhaps you take me seriously when you don't do the things that I've told you to do. To take Jesus seriously is to do the things that he said to do. To take Jesus seriously is to actually apply the things that Jesus has said to the way that you're living. And if you're not really doing that, then number one, you don't take Jesus seriously. And number two, he will be of no benefit to you. I mean, when we think about the benefits that Jesus can bring, what, remember what I said, right? There's forgiveness of sins. There's answers to prayer. There's the transformation of your being, and there's everlasting life. Tremendous benefits. Will any of those benefits come to a person that doesn't take Jesus seriously? No. 
I mean, Jesus is one person who I take seriously. And one of the reasons I take him seriously is I know this. He's not stupid. He can't be fooled. He sees things as they actually are. And when Jesus looks at a person who doesn't take him seriously and hopes somehow or another that none of it really matters in the end anyhow, and that they'll get whatever it is that he can hand out then, despite the fact they haven't taken him seriously. Um, when people think that way, they are in for a rude awakening. You say, well, that sounds awful harsh, Pastor. Have you read the Bible? Have you read the way that Jesus interacted with people? Have you read the things that Jesus said about people who don't take him seriously? Have you read the parable of the ten virgins? If Jesus isn't worth taking seriously, then he isn't worth bothering with at all. If he is worth taking seriously, then we seriously need to abide by the things that he says. Because the Bible does not tell us there's any benefit at all to giving God lip service and not having a heart that is for him. Where's your heart today? Is your heart taking Jesus seriously? Is Jesus something that actually impacts the way you live and the things that you do? Is Jesus someone who actually has some kind of effect on the way that you look at other people and the way that you treat them? Does Jesus affect the things that you value, the things that you count dear. When you think about the five things that you really want to accomplish in life, is Jesus any one of them? Or in any one of them? It, it pays to take Jesus seriously. Because Jesus delivers serious goods. And it is foolish not to take Jesus seriously. Because all the things that he's needed for are things of grave importance. All the things that we need him for are things that we can't do without. Does it pay to be cavalier about Jesus in your life? No. It makes no sense. Does it pay to be indifferent or distant from Jesus? No, it doesn't make any sense. Does it pay to live with Jesus as an afterthought? That doesn't guarantee an afterlife. Do you take Jesus seriously? Would you stand with me this morning in prayer?